Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless your name because of the privilege we always have to gather regularly before you and to share from your word together. We are praying that today you will open our understanding as we read the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. And the scriptures we read will strengthen our faith and keep us in your victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our study tonight we come to a significant part of the history of the early church. We're studying from Acts chapter 12, verses 21 to 25. And the chapter talks about persecution, about prayer, about the power of God, and about the fulfillment of the purpose of God ultimately. And it is possible to study the chapter from the perspective or from the angle of persecution and see what the attitude of the child of God ought to be in persecution. It's also possible to take the chapter and study it from the angle of prayer and see how there is so much efficacy in the name, in the blood of Jesus Christ as children of God will come together and pray fervently. It's also possible to look through the chapter and just see the power of God going through and seeing that the purpose of God will always be fulfilled whatever it may look like on the surface in the storms of life God's purpose will be fulfilled because his power is always at work but we'll take the whole story and bring out the various aspects of um, the prayer the persecution the power the purpose of God and we'll see the persecution of the preachers, Peter in prison, and punishment of the proud. In Acts chapter 12 from verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded forth to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, that is Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Here we're reading of Herod, the king over Judea at this time. And he stretched forth his hand to trouble the church, to vex the church. Not that he had any edict or any law that the church should not meet together, but he stretched forth his hand to take certain of the church. And when you touch preachers in the church or prophets in the church, or the men that minister to the church, you are troubling the church directly and indirectly. But as we read about Herod, we ought to remember kings before him who had tried the same thing, to stretch forth their hands to touch the people of God. Temporarily, they seem to have troubled the people of God or the church. But ultimately, they have died and the church or the people of God have continued. A number of names will come to our mind as we remember Pharaoh, who troubled the people of God. But eventually, the people of God multiplied. They were strengthened more and more. And yet, that man perished before his time. You remember Balaam and Balak. Balak wanted to stretch forth his hand and through the help of Balaam to curse the people. But eventually, because God is always on the throne to defend his people, Balaam and Balak perished. The children of Israel kept on marching on. And when you come to the time of Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar, and other kings like him, they perished because they attempted to touch the anointed nation, the anointed people of God. And 
the children of God just kept on growing and multiplying and being strengthened. At the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the herald of that time planned to stretch forth his hand, but temporarily he disturbed the peace of the people of God, but he also died. Here again we're reading of Herod, and uh, he stretched forth his hand to vex or to trouble certain people in the church. It was at that time he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. For any man to live in war against his creator is stupidity and foolishness. And yet, most men live their lives, their whole lives, fighting against God. But we're told in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 30, There is no wisdom, there is no understanding, there is no counsel against the Lord. That means anyone who goes against God demonstrates his lack of wisdom, understanding, and wise counsel. And yet, men sometimes foolishly set their wills against the will of God. And uh, we're reading of one of the most famous families that ever fought against God. That is, the Herods. But as we see the end of the story of his life, we see it never pays anyone to fight against God. Now, he stretched forth his hand against James, the brother of John, and he killed him with the sword. Now, as you read that on the surface, you might feel, after all, he has not destroyed one of the apostles. You might answer, you might ask, why? Why didn't God do something about it? Well, it wasn't strange at all to the other apostles. Neither was it strange to members of the church that knew the word of God very well. In Matthew chapter 20, Reading from verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, well, that, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in the kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. John and James, they were brothers, and they were sons of Zebedee. Their mother came to the Lord Jesus Christ to ask a special privilege or position one to sit on the one hand in the kingdom and the other to sit on the other side in the kingdom and uh, Jesus said you do not know what you are asking are you able to drink the bitter cup like the one I will drink when I face the trial the cross at Calvary are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I'll be baptized with and he said we're able and we're willing to drink that cup, and we're willing to be baptized with that baptism of um, agony and punishment and persecution, through which you will go. And he said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup. You will suffer the same thing, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Come back to the story. Herod stretched forth a hand. All he did was in fulfillment of what Jesus had said before. He was clever, but not wise. And you know, people who think they're very clever, they think that, you know, what they're doing will look so strange to God. They think that what they're doing against the church and against the people of God will look so strange to God and God will look at them and just say, all you're doing is what I knew before. And uh, what Herod did against uh, James, the brother of John, 
wasn't anything strange at all to the Lord Jesus Christ because he had known that before. And he had told James and John, indeed, you'll drink of the same cup. You'll be baptized of the same baptism. Now, in um, Acts chapter 12, when Herod saw that what he did pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, you know, the church was not afraid. Even though James had been killed, the church knew the truth. And they were so assured of the truth that they were willing to seal the truth they were preaching and standing upon with their blood. It is very significant that after James was killed, all the other apostles did not run away and scatter and feel we cannot do anything anymore and uh, just be overcome, overruled by fear. They had no fear. They knew that the death of James was according to the knowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God. And they knew that if God wanted them to keep on doing the work, they will keep on doing the work. And no matter how fierce or fiery Herod may be, he cannot go beyond the purpose of God. Therefore, they all remained in the church in Jerusalem. And even though some certain people were vexed in the church, the members of the church, they didn't scatter because of that. They didn't say, well, maybe the salvation message is not true because if the salvation message was true, why was James killed? There was no questioning. They knew God is God. Jesus is a savior. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. They knew that the death of James will not change or alter the doctrines of the word of God. They knew that those doctrines are true. Men may be wicked. Men may be satanic and follow after the plans of the devil and follow after the influence of the devil. But they knew that whatever the devil was doing through men, the word of God is still true. And persecution does not change the truth of the word of God. Suffering does not change the truth of the word of God. And uh, this is what we must realize today. Now individuals may persecuted, and even the church may face some persecution, but the truth remains the same. There is still heaven. There is still hell. There are still two ways. One leads unto life and the other leads into destruction. Life is still short and heaven is real and life beyond the grave is a reality. And it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment and the doctrines of the word of God will remain the same, remains true, whatever the kings and the princes of this world are doing. And so the church realized this. You know what the persecution did? It brought them closer together. It brought them in unity more and more together. And it brought them into the word of God more and more together. They examined that word. They looked at the promises of God. They looked at the plan of God. And they prayed much more than ever before. And that is what persecution should do to us. Instead of persecution scattering us, confusing us and making us to feel maybe what we have been taught is not right. The persecution, whenever it comes and whenever it is, should make us to keep close together, faithful to the Lord and yielded to the Lord and knowing that the devil will never defeat the purpose and the plan of God. And now in verse 3, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now look up at me here. The Bible has so much to say about men and the attitudes of men. No man likes to be unpopular. And even kings or presidents or governors or leaders in this world, they don't like to be unpopular. And if they're doing anything that the general public uh, doesn't appreciate, it hinders them. It restricts them. And um, whenever the public was um, in sympathy with the church, they're very careful with those men of God. And if they were even going to take men to arrest them, they'll be very careful lest the public will stone them. 
anything a king is doing, anything a president is doing, the president or the king is always watching the reaction of the public. And he's, if he sees that, his plans and strategies and attitude against a, a religious group or against a community is not popular, he will retreat. He will, he will go slowly. But you know, Herod at this time, he saw that when he killed uh, James, the Jews were happy. And because the Jews were happy, and he felt that, well, if the Jews are happy, I can make them happier with me. I can make uh, them just um, in unity with me if I stretch forth my hand to another of those apostles and preachers. And because of that, he stretched forth his hand to take Peter. And it was the days of unliving bread. And you know, at this time, he had to be very careful. Because it was at a time when the religious people in Israel were just all together. And they were going to observe the Passover. And uh, if he killed Peter at that time, that will not be a popular thing at all. Because uh, they were concerned with the religious festival. And if he did anything that would bring um, confusion in the city, at the time of that Passover, they will not be happy. And because of that, he kept him in the prison. Do you learn anything from that? That um, in any stage, in any country, in any nation, kings and presidents normally are supposed to watch the reactions and the feelings of the people. Now, Herod might not have been a committed um, religious person, or he might be, that doesn't actually matter. The point is, he knew that the religious festival of the people was very, very important to them. And whether he agreed with that religious festival or not, he was very careful, he will not do anything that will make the people feel, ah, you know, we're having a festival, and look at what you have done. And because it was that time of the unleavened bread, he couldn't kill Peter at that time. And uh, any president in any country, any governor in any state will be very careful if, um, you know, you're leading the people, you're governing the people. They should be very, very careful that religion is a sensitive thing to the people. And if it's at a time when the people are worshipping God, the way they know, they may even be wrong in their worship or they may be right in their worship. But if that is their way of worship, you want to be very careful you don't directly go against them. Um, you know those religious people because religious things are very sensitive and very deep in the hearts of the people therefore Herod here used some some sort of wisdom and in verse 4 when he had apprehended him he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions a quaternion uh, just means the uh, four people quartet four quarter a quarter one out of four quaternion four and four quaternions will mean 16 people of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter. Now the word Easter there is um, what the translators of the Bible put there in the English language. But in the original it just means the Passover. You know at the time of the Passover. That has been um, highlighted in verse 3. The, these were, then were the days of unleavened bread. Now it was uh, intending after that Passover to bring him forth to the people. And therefore he locked him up. But you know, at this time, he had made a serious mistake now. For James, what he did had already been prophesied by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you'll drink that cup and you'll be baptized with that same baptism I shall be baptized with. But now he caught Peter. I want you to look at John chapter 21 from verse 15. So when they are dying, Jesus says unto Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he says unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, Thou guarded thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, mark that in your Bible, Peter was going to live to old age. Jesus said so. Herod couldn't go against that. But Herod didn't know the prophecy. 
Herod didn't know the conversation between Jesus Christ and Peter. Now Jesus had said, When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall guard thee, and carry thee whither thou, know, whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Now come back to Acts chapter 12. Peter had now been taken, and Peter was imprisoned. And Herod was waiting that after the Passover, after the feast of the, the days of the unleavened bread, he'll bring Peter out and he will kill him. But then the church started to pray. Meanwhile, Peter was at rest. Peace, perfect peace. Troublous times, difficult times, dangerous times. When Herod was saying, oh, I'm just waiting for the days of the unleavened bread to be over and I'll kill that Peter. But Peter remembered that Jesus said, when thou art old. Then he looked at his age and he said, I'm not old yet. Jesus must do something about this. My case is different from the case of James because uh, uh, it followed just what Jesus had told James before, but and it, he must follow what he had told me. And so we come to the second uh, section. Peter now in prison. And we read from verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Times of distress and times of danger should be times of praying for the church. We know we must pray always, but especially must we pray. When we know that there is a general plan, strategic persecution against the church. And when we see the um, plans of the enemy, the plans of the enemies of the gospel, we must pray, pray more than ever before. And more must we pray for men of God and the preachers of the gospel who are perhaps the target of those heralds of the enemies of the gospel. And so they prayed. Actually, this was the third time that Peter was going to appear in prison. The first time, they themselves brought him out and they asked him, by what name, by what authority have you done this? And then the Spirit of God came upon him. He began to share the gospel with them. Another time he was taken to the prison, an angel went there in Acts chapter 5 and brought him out and said, you go and stand in the temple and declare the word of this life. But now this third time he was imprisoned again. And uh, we're told of the wonderful thing that the church did. The church started to pray. And here we read of the significant answer to their prayer. In the original, um, when it says, prayer was made without ceasing, it talks of fervent praying, joint praying, prayers by the church, all people everywhere, in the various houses where the churches were meeting, they were praying. And they were praying fervently with all their zeal, with all their emotion, and uh, with all the deep conviction and confidence within them, they were praying. And it says, without ceasing. Whatever they were doing at that time, because they knew it was a time of danger for the church, a time of serious persecution, planned systematic persecution against the church, they really prayed. And they did it without ceasing. In the day, in the day when uh, friends came together, they prayed. In the night when families came together, they prayed. And uh, even when they were outside, uh, maybe doing some things, they were still in the mood and in the attitude of praying. They were bombarding heaven, saying, Oh God, James is gone, this one must not go. James is gone, this one must not go. You must do something. All that time of the days of unleavened bread, when the others were happily celebrating the Passover, all these people, they were really praying. It wasn't for them a time of uh, merriment, a time of joy, a time of remembrance that, you know, their forefathers came out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan. It was for them a time they just had concerted effort praying together. And they prayed unto God. That's significant. They prayed unto God. They prayed unto God. That same God. That same God. The ancient of days. 
who dealt with Pharaoh. They said, God, remember? You are the same God. That same God that dealt with the kings of the, of the Canaanite lands. That same God. That dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. That dealt with Belshazzar. That same God. And the same God that dealt with Herod that reigned before this Herod. That same God. They prayed unto God for him. That prayer was not a general prayer, you know, praying for progress and praying for evangelism and praying for this. They were praying for Peter. All the people were busy praying for Peter. They wanted his deliverance. And in verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison uh, you know there were 16 um, soldiers and they were divided into four because the Jewish people divided the night into four and uh, four people will watch at the uh, first watch and four people will watch at the second watch then the third watch then the fourth watch for the four people two were changed to Peter you know, just for three hours. And then two were at the gate. And then after three hours, those uh, soldiers are changed. Uh, these two will come off and another two will be changed to Peter again. They just uncuffed him so that he will not run anywhere. And two other soldiers, it was real tight security because um, Herod knew that if he missed killing that man, he would lose his popularity with the Jews. Everybody was waiting for the Passover to be over, and then they will have a merriment as they will watch Peter being killed, a barbarous set of people, cannibals. They just liked uh, to see the blood of uh, creatures of God. Now you think about it. Even if a person wasn't a Christian, the fact that that other person is a human being, and the fact that he was created by God it should make you to respect his life and whatever he's doing. If he says he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and he believes in God, that's his business. And it ought to be a free thing. I should have the liberty to decide that I want to worship God the way I want. And if I say that heaven is real and Jesus is the one that will take me to heaven, I should have the liberty to follow that Jesus Christ and allow him to take me to heaven. I don't think that any other man, whether king or president or governor, should determine who I worship and should determine whether I go to heaven or not. I think it ought to be my own decision that I want to go to heaven. You know, kings are supposed to just rule the people and they are supposed to determine things that are physical, not things that are spiritual. You shouldn't determine what I believe and what I stand upon. You shouldn't tell me that I must go to hell if I say, my friend, that is the way to hell. You shouldn't say, I'm a king, just obey me, go to hell. No, I won't go to hell. I would like to go to heaven. How about you? You like to go to heaven. You don't, like any, you don't like anybody to come and tell you, this is the way to hell. Go there, whether king or president. You want to stand upon the word of God that says there is no other way that, goes to, that leads to heaven. This narrow way is the only one that leads to heaven. And there is no other name, whoever you can be saved, except through the name of Jesus Christ. Following Jesus is not something we cover our mouths before we talk. Following Jesus is not what we hide in a cave and talk about. Following Jesus is a personal matter that decides whether you go to heaven or not. And because that is my conviction, a king or anybody, Herod or, or Nebuchadnezzar, has to leave me alone to worship my God the way I want to worship him. And kings ought to realize that what they, uh, what they decide for people is something physical, something temporal, something with you know local government area, administration, and the water system, and physical things but when it comes to spiritual and heavenly things you leave that man to his conviction and but you know all these believers were praying they were not going to allow anybody to shake them away from their personal conviction of wanting to go to heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ and um, you know in verse 6 while the soldiers were keeping watch Peter was sleeping don't you like that sleeping in the midst of his enemies. The soldiers were just tied to him. And it was a day to the execution. 
And you know, if they had newspapers at that time, the newspapers were carrying it, we're going to execute that uh, foolish uh, fanatic. We're going to get rid of him. And uh, while all the news was going on, Peter said, what is the best thing to sleep? He looked at the wristwatch and he said, if they had wristwatch at that time, I don't know. He looked at the watch and said, well, I think I should just sleep. And you know, he went to sleep. And all those soldiers were standing at attention. They will not sleep. All those people at the gate, they were standing there. They will not sleep. And there was a timetable in heaven. God looking at what he will do. And when he will do it. And then, you know, this God is wonderful. You can't have a plan that will beat the plan of the Almighty God. You can't do it. You can't do it. You know, Peter knew that he must grow until old age. And because of that, he knew that no matter what the other people were saying, no matter what Herod was planning, the time of death, it has not come yet. And we're told in verse 6 that Herod would have brought him forth. That same night, Peter was sleeping between the two soldiers and bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Does he still have angels? Are there still angels in heaven? Yes. And you can be sure if you need 10,000 of them to come around you and to keep you, God will send them. Amen. The angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hand. And you know, I don't know what injection the angel gave the two soldiers that were standing by, but heavenly anesthetics, they just went to sleep. The chains fell off, and you know the chain will make some sound. They didn't even at least, they didn't hear of the sound. And the angel said unto him, God thyself. And they didn't hear the voice of the angel, but Peter had the voice of the angel. Bind on thy sandals, and so he did. And he says unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And he wished not, he knew not, that it was through which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second watch, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city. You know this man, eh, Peter, my brother, my sister, you should have faith in God. At a time of persecution, have faith in God. Don't get into hypertension, high blood pressure, because people are persecuting. They will never go beyond the plan of God. Because God will limit whatever the unbelievers, whatever the enemies of the gospel can do. God will limit everything. Be, never be terrified by danger. You can sleep in the midst of your enemies. You know, the gates and the guards kept all his friends from him, but could not keep the angel of God from him. The angel came through the gate and through all those guards, and the people of God have an open world, a heavenward um, channel to heaven. And nothing can intercept our intercourse or discussion or communion with God. And he followed this angel and he came out. And when they came to the iron gate that led us into the city, which it opened to them of his own accord, even the iron gate. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Now, we're learning here that you should rest on the promises of God. What are the two, two things that made Peter to be able to sleep a night to the time of the execution? Number one, the promise. I read it to you that Jesus said when you are come to old age, this is what will happen. And he knew there was a promise in that statement. And because of the promise in that statement, he said, I'm still going to get to old age. I'm still going to get to old age. I'm still going to get to old age. You read the promises of God. And when you read the promises of God, those promises will keep you. And will keep you from worry, keep you from anxiety, keep you from fear, keep you from timidity, and keep you from any oppression. You stand upon the promises of God and you will never be moved. Number two, past performances. I told you I had been in prison before. 
And because he had been in prison before, he had seen the performance of God before. That God performed according to his divine will, according to the promise that was given out. The mercies he saw before assured him of what will happen in the future. You look at your life and count your blessings and name them one by one. When you get into another persecution, you look back and say, well, such and such a time, I passed through that, deep waters, deep waters, and I passed through that other thing, real burning fire, and yet I wasn't uh, drowned in the water, I wasn't burnt with the fire, and because of the promise, number one, because of the past performance, number two, the Lord will see me through, and he will see you through. Your life is significant in the sight of the Lord. And you know, God has a job, a duty for you to do on earth. Do you know that? If you didn't know that before, you must write that down. God has a duty for you to perform on earth. And until you have finished it, nobody can stop you on earth. It has to be finished. It has to be finished. And wherever you are now, whatever you are doing now, if you just follow the Lord and you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody can terminate your life before you have finished the performance of your duty. God will see you through. And um, the Lord sent this angel, and the angel came, and um, he was delivered. And we learned from that that um, we should be watching for the deliverance that God will bring. And if we watch for the deliverance uh, that God will bring, when that deliverer comes, we shall follow that deliverer. Uh, you know, whenever you come here on Thursdays and we begin to pray, you follow all that the Lord is doing because God has put in the church, the gifts in the church that will make uh, you to be delivered from every oppression and every antagonism against your life and against your faith. Now, let's see from verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he, says, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jews. He said, Now I know. Now I know that the Lord has delivered me from the expectation of the Jews. But brothers and sisters, let me remind you again. Of what I taught you last week, um, Thursday. He had been delivered by the angel. But then we are told in verse 10, the latter part of verse 10, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. He had been delivered miraculously. He must now be directed naturally. The deliverance was miraculous, supernatural. It took an angel to take him out of the prison. But now he was left in the street. As he was in the street, he must now use his common sense. Never throw away your common sense, sanctified sense, your natural ability, your normal understanding, your natural experience, natural wisdom. Never throw it away. We've said that over and over. As he was on the street, he didn't need the gifts of the spirit to direct him as to where he will go. Because now, he, he now was awake, and he said, the Lord has delivered me. Where now will I go? He must not remain on the street, because if he remained there, the soldiers uh, may just wake up, and uh, when they wake up, they'll be searching for him. And if they sought for him and found him in that place, then they'll bind him again and capture him, and they will seriously torture him. And because of that, he considered, in verse 12, and when he had considered the thing, he had considered the thing. My brother, my sister, there are times you need to consider. In your family, there is a problem. You have prayed and God has given you a solution in a miraculous way. And there is a little thing that still ought to be done to complete that solution. And you know what it is. Now you will not say, well, I will wait for God to direct. Oh, no. God has given you experience through Bible verses and through uh, your past uh, performance. And you ought to know what to do. He, he had considered the thing. And there are times in the church that, you know, the church has a problem. And uh, this problem, we have prayed, and we ought to pray. I've shown you in the Bible how they prayed fervently. And the fervent effectu effectual prayer of a righteous man um, has much power, availeth much. But then after we have prayed and God has answered, there may be things we ought to just tidy up in a natural way with natural wisdom, with normal experience. 
and uh, you know at that time the church should wake up and do that thing that ought to be done in a natural way and that's what Peter did here now what great wisdom and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son's name was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, look up here. Let me tell you something. You know, we should not be wiser than God. If Peter stood up there and he said, if I run away now, what will happen to those soldiers that were chained to me? Will not Herod kill them? Is that your business? Are they not servants of Herod? Whatever they do with themselves, that's their business. Now, God knew about those soldiers before he sent an angel in heaven to come and deliver you. And then to stand up there and say, well, well, I don't think I should just go away. I will go back to those soldiers and uh, say, soldiers, an angel came to deliver me, and, uh, but uh, I have mercy on you. Now, if I run away now, what do you think Herod will do to you? They grab him immediately. That's a foolish man. Foolish man. And you know some Christians are foolish like that. If God has sent an angel, has sent an angel from heaven to deliver you, let the rest be in the hands of God. And those soldiers who are serving the devil and serving Herod, those soldiers who know that they are going to take that apostle and kill the apostle, the apostle and the ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, the representative of God, and they were putting themselves under the authority of Herod to watch over him. Well, they have already known that uh, if uh, God is against their plan and God is against their way, and Peter escaped, they will pay for what they are doing, for serving the enemy. That's their business. And so, you know, when you, when you are considering the scriptures, you must consider what's the will of the Lord. And you know that Peter, when he had considered the sin, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son name was Mark. And there were many gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to her king, named Rhoda. That means Rose. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness and ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. That lady was going to get Peter into trouble. Peter kept on knocking. And you know, if he knocked very hard, the neighbors can wake up. And some of the people that like to be in the good book of Herod may just uh, run to Herod and say, You know what is happening? I saw Peter knocking at that place. You know, everything that God does is very important. And whatever you do, whether you are ordered to open the door, when you hear that voice of Peter, don't be overjoyous. Make sure that everything is done on time. And whenever you are given responsibility, because the security of Peter at this time was, uh, you know, very, very important. But uh, Rhoda, uh, at this time, because of the voice of Peter, he was too joyful. He left the door locked and left Peter outside and he ran back to the prayer meeting. You know what started in the prayer meeting? Argument. Church people. You know how church people can be sometimes foolish? Completely foolish. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they then said they, oh, it is his angel. And Peter is still there, knocking. And, and if he knocked hard, he can wake the neighbors. He can wake them up and they'll just catch him again. Church, let's be wise. Let's do the work of God the way it ought to be done. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and they were... They were astonished. They were surprised. But why were they praying if they didn't expect an answer? They are like typical church people. They are praying for God to heal them. And eventually something like cold water comes upon them and they become healed. And they are surprised. And they said, I didn't know the healing would be so fast. Or they are praying for God to give them children. And then uh, they miss their monthly period. And they say, ah, ah, is it so? Is it so? What were you praying for? And the answer has now come. They were praying there. It was a prayer meeting. And the Peter got in there. And when they saw him, they said, Is it you? They were surprised that God could give an answer. It is teaching us a lot. But you know what is surprising here? These people were praying. And it appears from what we're seeing here, their faith was weak. 
Because while Peter was knocking and Rhoda said, um, Peter is knocking. If they were having strong faith, they should have risen up to say, praise the Lord. Peter has been delivered. No, their faith was not strong. And the while Rhoda kept on saying, it is Peter, it is Peter. If they really believed, they should have said, okay, let's go and open the door. They said, no, it's his angel. And eventually when the, the knocking went on, the knocking continued. And then they opened the door and they saw him, they were surprised. But you know what that tells me? God can give a miracle to those of weak faith. You know, if somebody has weak faith, but he refuses to sleep, and he says, so God, answer us, answer us. And he continues to pray. Instead of sleeping, he continues to pray. Even if his faith is weak, God will surprise him with an answer. And you know, your faith may be weak. You gather some brothers together with you and spend about one hour, two hours on that problem. God will honor your, your desire, your fervency, your zeal in prayer. And sister, even though you may feel your faith is weak, look at the people here. They were surprised when the answer came. Keep on praying. The answer will come in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, sometimes we say the church is having a problem. And the zonal leaders are saying, well, we would have gathered our zonal members together. But you know, their faith is weak. Gather them together. Gather them together. God will honor the weak faith of the members of his kingdom. Because the weakness of faith of a little child of God is greater than the courage and the boldness of the people of the world. And our prayers will work wonders. Our prayers will get miracles. And so, if there is a problem in your life, you can gather other people together. Don't measure your faith. Don't say, well, the faith is weak. Keep on praying. Your answer is on the way. And in verse 17, But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James. I thought James is dead. Now this is another James. The James that was dead was the brother of John. This James is a brother of Joseph. The one that wrote epistle, to, epistle of James. And the one that we read about in Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 and Galatians chapter 1 verse 19. This is that other James. He said, go and show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Look up here. When you study Bible, study it well. In verse 17, while they were about to rejoice, oh, praise the Lord, they said, shut up, don't make noise, don't wake up the neighbors, he beckoned unto them. Security. He didn't want the neighbors to wake up and then maybe there is a police station nearby will say, what noise is that? And they'll discover it is Peter they were expect preparing. To, to kill tomorrow, it is this Peter. They just arrest all the people there and Peter and take him back to prison. You know, there are times you should be able to keep your mouth shut. As an usher. When it relates to security and relates to the work of God, there are times you ought to keep your mouth shut. And he beckoned to them to hold their peace. And then he said, go and show this to James. He wasn't going to go to James himself. Because while he's walking about to show himself to this one, show himself to this one, they can catch him again. And then it says, he went to another place. They didn't name that place. They didn't make announcement. Now, uh, you will not see our brother, the apostle Peter, for some time. He's going to go to... Uh, how many of you know that place in Judea? They mentioned that. How many of you know the place? They raise up their hands. How many of you don't know? They raise up their hands. Okay, those of you don't know, it's on the way to, when you are going to Samaria, you are going to Joppa, he's going to stay there. He's going to rest there a while. Because of all these people, there will be some young Christians there who will be giving testimony to their neighbors, uh, you know, back at home. I will say, ah, we thank God. A miracle happened last night. Peter came out of the prison. An angel delivered him. And in fact, he is resting now. You will not hear him preach in uh, Jerusalem for some time. You know where he is resting? And that young Christian will tell them the whole story. And they will just go there and catch Peter again. The Bible is wonderful. It says he went to another place. But 
that place was not written down. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small star among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down to Judea, uh, to, uh, from Judea to uh, Caesarea, and there abode. He became so ashamed, he packed out of town. You know, he had told all the people, they will see what he will do against that church and what he will do against Peter. And the angel of the Lord spoiled his plan and he just went and he, rest, he went to rest in Caesarea. And now Herod, let's see the punishment of the proud man. Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But when but they came with one accord to him, and having made blasters, the king's chamberlain, their friend, and des they desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon his third day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. God resists the proud. The persecutor has his day, but the worms have their day when they feed on the persecutor. The persecutor may have his time while he runs in aggression against the people of God. But the judgment of God has a day when it catches up with that persecutor and proud person and then judgment comes. He was eating of worms. Look at this. Shameful death. A great man. But he wasn't strong enough to resist the worms. How about the word of God? How about the church? Verse 24. And the word of God grew and multiply and the word of God grew and multiply you know it's always so it's always so and it is still going to be so today yeah. while the persecutors and the proud people are dead and buried the church of God will keep on marching on yeah. and the word of God will grow and multiply the almighty God in heaven is watching after that word is watching after that word and his purpose will be fulfilled and in verse 25 we are told and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they took with them John whose surname was Mark tonight we have seen God's power in answer to the prayer of the children of God at the time of the persecution of the church to fulfill the purpose of God and today, if we will pray, we'll see the power of God. Even if it's at a time of persecution, the purpose of God will still be fulfilled in your life, 100% without anything taken away from your life in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a child of God, heaven has a plan about your life. If you're a child of God, Jesus has a plan about your life. And if he needs to send ten thousands of his angels to watch over you and to help you, he will. You have nothing to fear. But remember, even after he has sent his angel, even after he has sent his Holy Ghost, even after he has sent an answer to your prayer, let's also use our common sense. And let's do what we ought to do to make sure that we don't intentionally, deliberately, foolishly put ourselves in a place of danger. Rise up and let us pray. Thank God for what he has taught us tonight. Thank God for the greatness of the God we serve. The power of the God we serve. The wisdom of the God we serve. And he's your God. He will help you. He is your God. He will help you. He will protect you. He will not allow any temptation that comes to you to be greater than the grace he has given you. It's a loving God. He'll protect you.